We've got a sulfide deposit. Um, and uh, what we've modeled uh, in our PEA was producing a concentrate and selling it to a smelter uh, to produce class one nickel, either metal or briquettes. And briquettes is one of the forms of nickel that the battery makers really want right now. Hello, welcome to Assay TV. Today, I'm joined by Mark Jarvis, who is the CEO and Chairman of the Board at Giga Metals. Giga Metals are developing a nickel and cobalt project in British Columbia. Mark, great to see you uh, today. I mean, start things off. I mean, amazing times for the nickel market at the moment. Uh, prices are at an all-time high. What's going on? Yes, uh, it's, it's, it's quite interesting. It's a, it's a significant short squeeze that's happening. Um, and my understanding is that Qingshan uh, is uh, very, very short. Um, you know, I've heard as much as 100,000 tons short. And uh, they've been scrambling to cover since the war in the Ukraine started, which takes, you know, effectively takes the Russian supply off the market. And Russia is about 17% of class one nickel production in the world. So, uh, and Qingshan... Uh, doesn't really produce much in the way of class one nickel. They produce ferro nickel. They, they produce nickel pig iron and a lot of it. But they also have a trading arm that uh, likes to trade nickel. And they have been caught short, apparently. And uh, they're getting squeezed uh, very badly. And so the LME actually uh, today halted trading in nickel, which is unprecedented. Um, a lot of traders are very upset that this halt was installed. Um, so, you know, I mean, we've gone from, uh, I think nickel was around $12 a pound two or three days ago. Uh, it's gone as high as like $45 a pound just over the last couple of days. It's tripled. This is unprecedented. Uh, nobody expects, of course, that nickel will uh, stay where it is. Uh, the short squeeze will resolve itself one way or the other, and then nickel should return to something like a normal trading range. Um, nickel was... Uh, um, in an uptrend already uh, because it's getting supplies are getting very tight. Supplies of nickel suitable for battery cathodes is getting tight. Uh, I don't think there's any shortage of ferro nickel in the world um, suitable for stainless steel, but the, but the stuff that uh, uh, translates e you know, easily and economically into battery cathode material is in very short supply. Mm. And let's just um, remind our viewers, I mean, you talk about class one nickel and, um, you know, the nickel that you guys are looking to produce very much going into, into the batteries. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's how we've modeled it. Uh, we've got a sulfide deposit um, and uh, what we've modeled uh, in our PEA was producing a concentrate and selling it to a smelter uh, to produce class one nickel, either metal or briquettes. And briquettes is one of the forms of nickel that the battery makers really want right now. It's easy to process that into cathode materials. Uh, the other form of nickel that's very, very much in demand, uh, the chemical form of nickel known as mixed hydroxide precipitates, MHP, is very, very much in demand. And so uh, as we advance the project to pre-feasibility, uh, one of the things we're planning to do is a bolt-on study where we will take our concentrate uh, and put it through a pressure oxidation circuit which is capable of producing uh, MHP. We could also produce nickel sulfate, depending what the market wants at the time. And the reason we're looking at that is uh, obviously extra capex, you know, extra opex, but the payables for MHP right now are in excess of 90% for both nickel and cobalt. Um, you know, probably as more MHP comes on the market, those payables will decrease, we're thinking to the 85 to 90% range over time. But those extra payables compared to what a smelter would pay uh, are quite attractive uh, and will also mean that we can um, uh, model a lower grade concentrate with higher recoveries. We think we can increase our recoveries by about 5% by going for a 14% concentrate and then processing through MHP or, or processing through a pressure oxidation circuit. Um, and 5% extra recovery in a project like this is huge. So um, we think this is going to be accretive to our economics. Just to step back a second, I mean, uh, what this project is, it's like so many of the large undeveloped uh, nickel projects in the world. 
And when I say large, we're, you know, we modeled a producing an average of 33,000 tons a year of nickel over a 37 year mine life. So truly a giant project. Um, but it and all of the other uh, undeveloped nickel projects, large undeveloped nickel projects in the world are not really economic at the low end of the nickel price range. So we modeled our PEA at seven and a half dollars a pound uh, nickel and the economics were not very good at that price. Every extra dollar uh, in the price of nickel adds $550 million US to our depreciated net present value at a discount rate of 8%. So we're right on that knife edge. And the whole investment thesis in our company is that this is leverage. So if you get 11 or $12 nickel, we we think we're gonna have quite handsome economics. Um, mm -hmm. And of course, uh, today's close, a forced close of $45 a pound of nickel or so, it's crazy. I think, uh, I, think our, I think our PV8 at that price is, God, I don't even know, it's 15 billion or some crazy number. But, but again, that's not a number that's gonna hold. That's not a normal nickel market at all. Mm. Absolutely. Um, EV uh, manufacturers, they're looking for nickel that has a low carbon footprint. Um, tell us a little bit about what you're doing to make sure your nickel is as carbon free as possible. Well, we are uh, just the way we modeled in the PEA. Our carbon intensity is 2.4 tons uh, of carbon per ton of nickel produced. Um, and that is using a diesel fleet. Um, if we could use an electric fleet, um, which doesn't exist today, but which is rapidly being developed. I think probably by the time we build this mine, um, it'll be available. That would take us to about 0.7 tons per ton. Um, and then we, uh, we are also doing a lot of uh, uh, test work uh, in conjunction with Dr. Greg Dippel at the University of British Columbia into how much CO2 our tailings will sequester from the atmosphere just with passive sequestration, just spread out our sands and beaches in the tailings management facility. They will absorb CO2 from the atmosphere um, and convert the silicate minerals to carbonate minerals. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and the CO2 isn't stored. It's actually sequestered in, in a mineral form, but it's basically gone forever. Mm -hmm. So, it's very interesting, it's measurable. And uh, we think using that, we can get our, our carbon footprint to under zero. Fantastic. And tell us a little bit about the current status of, of the project. You've done, a, you've done a PEA on the project, as you mentioned. That's um, right. give, us some, give us some sort of timelines as, as to how long it's gonna take you to get to sort of PFS and then, and then into, into production possibly. We're hoping to get to PFS by the end of this year. And uh, that's what we're working on. Um, and uh, once we get our PFS uh, finished, uh, we plan to file a project description, which will, in, which will kick off the environmental assessment process. And so we think, uh, you know, we think three years is a pretty good guess for that. The environmental assessment process will be the, sort of the slowest part of, of, of the development process we can do the engineering to full feasibility much quicker than that. So we think within three years of uh, filing, uh, filing a project description, we can uh, be shovel ready. Hmm. Absolutely. And what are your plans for 2022? I mean, what are the sort of key milestones you're hoping to hit this year? Well, you know, uh, working on that uh, PFS is, 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 is the main thing fundamentally. Uh, however, uh, we're also seeking to answer that uh, question which is so common in the mining business when you've got a tiny company with a with a gigantic project how do you actually get the thing built you know uh, how does a company with a market cap of say 40 million dollars uh, you know get a get a project that's 1.5 billion or so uh, built um, and so the answer is you really do have to have strategic investors uh, involved at the project level. And I'll tell you one of the interesting things uh, about the last couple of days is that it's really sort of um, rung the alarm bells with battery manufacturers. Uh, you know, uh, Western battery manufacturers, frankly, do not have their supply chains figured out. 
whereas the Chinese battery manufacturers do. And so uh, the Chinese have got a, a strong, strong competitive edge because of that. And so, and particularly for people that are looking at building gigafactories in North America, they would like to have a North American supply. Just the, uh, just, just the projects that have been announced, the gigafactories that have been announced, uh, are going to require something on the order of an incremental 250,000 tons a year of nickel, uh, you know, in a form suitable to convert to cathode material. And frankly, there's not that much available in North America. I think all of the projects in North America are going to have to be developed just to feed those gigafactories. So, uh, and, and, and of the really large projects in North America, of the ones that can produce, you know, in excess of 30,000 tons a year of nickel, we're the only one that's focused on the cathode uh, of, of, of batteries. All the others are focused uh, and, and, and of engineering uh, as, uh, as a ferro-nickel deals that are uh, looking to market to the stainless steel business rather than the battery business. Mm, absolutely. Um, so for, 20, for your 2022 program, how's your, how's your funding looking? Uh, well, we've got uh, we've got a lot of the money we need. We don't have all of the money we need to get all the way to pre-feasibility. We've got enough to get into our our uh, our property and do the property work we need to get done this year. We've just got a little bit of work left to do uh, for uh, to get enough data to support a pre-feasibility study. Uh, we've got enough money for our ongoing metallurgical and and uh, geometallurgical studies. We will need more money to get the uh, pre-feasibility done. Um, and frankly, we're hoping uh, and we're quite optimistic that it will be a strategic uh, investor that will uh, uh, put that money in um, at the project level rather than at the stock level. Mm, absolutely. Um, so if people want to find out more about the company, uh, where should they go to look? Well, gigametals.com. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Mark, for joining us today for this update and uh, best of luck for the year ahead. Well, thank you very much, Leo. Pleasure talking to you. Thanks. Cheers.